welcome everybody. We we got a great crowd tonight. So uh excited to coach everybody up here. Uh action packed hour uh as it typically is. Um and, and we usually try to be pretty good about uh signing off right on the dot here. Put our kids to bed. Uh <laughs> or at least help, or at least uh at least assist. So we'll do what we can here. So um, let's give everybody a second to get settled and, and then we'll, um, we'll dive right into the content. And, and, and like I said, it's these kind of, um, presentations specifically, uh, th there's a lot because we're going to get you coached up on kind of the financial piece of the puzzle, need-based financial aid scholarships, but then also admissions. And obviously tonight it's, it's about threading the needle, right. And how do we, how do we build this list of colleges that, uh, we know are going to be great fits for our kids, um, but they're also not going to put us at a disadvantage financially. So that's uh, that's the name of the game tonight, and uh, we're uh, we're excited to deliver on that promise. Um, but before we get going, it, it's always fun for us to learn a couple things. Number one, what's what what's a graduating class, high school class of your student, right? I think for for most folks, we're talking a class of 2025. I'm sure there's some. 26 is in here, but let us know when your kid's graduating and then where, where are you at in the country? Um, you know, tell us, tell us where you are. Uh, that's, that's always exciting for us too, because we always have a very good uh, representation, really even internationally, um, you know, uh, geographically. So of course, lots of folks in uh, tri-state area, NYC, New Jersey, Northwest Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, and Hong Kong. How about that? How's that combo? It's not a combo oh. you see every day. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Santa Fe. Yeah, we, we've had a good representation of... Uh, oh, the Newbury Port. There you go. Yeah. But a, a fellow Cape Ann folks. Yeah. So if, anybody visiting Boston, Newbury Port's a great... If you're looking for a little day trip that's kind of off the beaten path maybe doesn't get uh, as much press it's a awesome awesome little town north of boston here um and that's where i am i'm, I'm in salem mass uh, i live just over the bridge in, in in beverly mass we got another north of boston uh slightly inland buddy here brian's in in uh in redding mass right brian Wilmington, right next to redding yeah we're Brown a little Rick. close we're a little close to the city about well, 20 minutes north on a good day, about 50 minutes north on most days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so for those of you that are new to us, uh, uh, we're College Aid Pro. Uh, my name is Matt Carpenter. I'm one of the founders. Brian Fords, I would say, are kind of top dog on the admissions front. We've collaborated uh, in, in a number of ways in, in the last uh, 15 or so years. Um, I think Brian's probably the best, my kind of first, call when I have a question around anything admissions. Uh, there's there's a, a, a few reasons for that, but one of them is is he's got this unique background where he's been on all sides of the fence. Uh, he's been uh, worked for many, many years, I think a decade plus, and obviously I'll let him tell his, his kind of quick uh, story um, as a college admission, uh, admissions officer, right? Uh, and I think the last place at Boston University with the UCs, but this is a, this is a guy that's read 60,000 plus applications, right? So he knows, and he's been in these rooms with the admissions committees that are figuring out who got in, who didn't get in and why. And he's taken kind of that experience, that expertise and and been on the other side of the table, right? Both as, as a uh, admissions counselor privately, right, in, in working with us, and then also at some of the more prestigious uh, high schools, private high schools here in the Boston area. Uh, let's see, Austin Prep, Archbishop Williams, and now BC High, and BC High is considered one of the top um, private uh, Catholic high schools and probably top high schools uh, in the country. So um, so we're just really grateful to, to, to have him just be able to give his knowledge and coach you all up and really us up. I, I learn something every time. So uh, we're going to make sure that we get to that. And and then again, we're going to start um, with the financial piece and I'm going to lead the charge there. This is something I've been doing for 20 years on, on the nose class 2025 is, a, is the 20th class that I've kind of shepherded through this process. Um, and that's, that's what we like to do. We like to be the North star, especially with you guys are probably hearing some of this stuff with this fast, a mess this year. And people are like, where do we turn? We like to say here, right? We we have your answers, and 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 we'll get you pointed in the right direction. But 
Brian, why don't you say hi quick and then we'll kind of dive into the content. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I'll just I'll just kind of almost echo and, and kick it back in that um, Matt is is almost always my first call whenever there's a question that I have in regards to financial aid. Um, we've had the great opportunity to kind of work with each other and work with now, you know, dozens upon dozens of families kind of together, or just assisting. Um, you know, as far as my experience goes, yeah, I've, I've seen kind of everything at this point. But what I'll also say is I think you guys are all taking a, a great first step. Um, this has been an incredibly unique year in college admissions for so many different reasons. And we'll go into that a little bit tonight. And so um, your ability to get some great information tonight um, to possibly see how we can help, but but also just to kind of learn about what the current landscape is like and how to take that first step is is a huge kind of first step for you. And so excited to kind of help you through that process. Beautiful. Let's let's do this thing. Let me see if I can. Uh... Oh, and um, one thing I'll say before Matt gets started too is, as questions come in, um, do your best to use the Q and A. Um, both of us will kind of man it. It's just a lot easier for us to track in, in the Q and A than it is in the chat. So the more you can put your questions in there, the better. Yeah, and and challenge us. Take us up on that, right? And you can be anonymous. So if you have a really personal question, put it in there. We're going to do our best to answer it and. Uh, that's the point of tonight, right? This is what you're here for. And I'm sure that we're going to do our best to anticipate a lot of the questions that you all have, but, um, you know, we might not hit all of them. So please uh, let us know what's keeping you up at night. That's that's a part of uh, a big point of all these presentations is just to to make sure that, again, we're uh, uh, making life easier on you when it comes to this stuff. So, again, a little bit about us. We have this very ambitious uh, mission of ending the student debt crisis and this is where we do it is uh, kind of upstream, right? Uh, you hear a lot about this $1.7 trillion in, in student loan debt, right? How we avoid doing that is by getting ahead of it and making good decisions at this stage of the game uh, where, where you all are at um, at the moment. So I know uh, most of you already created your cap accounts, which is great, right? Your free cap accounts. Do that right now if you haven't already, right? Take the two minutes to do that. I'm putting the link in the chat as we speak. Um, because, and I'll be uh, in and out of that platform a, a little bit tonight because it's the best way to show some case studies. But it answers kind of, I think, the first questions that most folks have on the financial piece of this. And that is, am I eligible for financial aid? How much? At which colleges? Is my kid likely to get scholarships? How much? At which colleges? Um, what are colleges actually going to cost me, right? Am I going to pay full sticker price? Can I expect discounts? And again, at which colleges? So that's uh, one of, of, of the things that our platform does kind of right away. Um, it, it does a whole lot more than that. But at this stage of the game for you underclassmen, that's what you want to be thinking about, again, specifically when it comes to the financial piece of this. So I'm going to start high level and then we're going to drill down and again, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time um, talking about the financial, um, educating you guys on the financial piece of this before Brian's going to get you educated on the admission side. So in its simplest, in its simplest terms, financial aid is a discount from the sticker price of college, right? Anytime we're not paying full rack rate, full sticker price or the full cost of attendance out of college, that means we're getting some type of financial aid. And there's three broad buckets, right? Three basic ways that we can be awarded financial aid. We're focused on the first two buckets. Why? That's free money. Free money we don't have to pay back. Uh, and of course, don't have to pay back plus interest. Need-based grants, this is discounts that are given based on your family's financial profile. So your income and assets are the biggest drivers uh, of that financial profile. And then how generous or not are the particular colleges that you're applying to. And, and again, we will get more specific uh, as we go on here. The second bucket in some ways is on the other end of the spectrum because these are discounts that are given uh, th that have nothing to do with your family's financial situation, everything to do with your students' credentials and what the particular college is looking for, right? So our traditional merit-based scholarships. So discounts that that are given just based on a college looking at your students kind of overall resume for lack of a better word, right? Their applications, their essays, their GPA, their test scores, their extracurriculars and saying, you know what? We want this kid at our school. We're gonna give them a financial incentive to come here, right? The last type of financial aid, it's the one that we care about least. 
uh, because it's a essentially self-help financial aid is a sexy term for loans, right? Yes, we're getting a discount initially off the sticker price, but we're going to have to pay that back and, and usually plus uh, some type of interest and sometimes a meaningful amount of interest. So again, we're least focused on targeting that bucket, even though in, in many times there's there's a need for it. Uh, it's 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 something that we don't want to disregard, but obviously that's that's uh, the least of um, you know the or, or the least uh, favorable type of uh, financial aid. So I'm going to start with need based financial aid because something that you're going to hear us say ad nauseum, and if you've been following along with us for any point of time, you hear us say this every presentation, probably more than once. Every college is different, right? This is not a streamlined process. You have to treat them like individual businesses and they each run their business differently. Okay. And they change every single year and sometimes mid-year, right? There's going to be some changes. So anytime there's a universal formula or theme or whatever, we just want to get super comfortable with that so we can anchor to it. And one good thing about need-based financial aid is that every college uses the same um, high-level formula to determine a family's eligibility for need-based financial aid. And this is it. That is the cost of attendance, right? In layman's terms, the sticker price. Some of you might have seen the headlines this week that NYU next year will be $99,000 a year. You heard that right. $99,000 a year. So again, a hundred grand. We we've basically got there a hundred grand a year for, for college sticker price, right? But for most families, that sticker price is a misleading figure. Okay. And we're going to learn that tonight. For most families, the sticker price is kind of a distraction for whether or not that that college is going to be affordable for your family. The two bigger or more important variables are the student aid index, right? That's a dollar amount that gets assigned to your family, specifically the student based largely on your family's income and assets. If that dollar amount, if that student aid index is less than the cost of attendance at a college, now we are potentially, okay, that keyword potentially, eligible for need-based financial aid at that school. Let's talk about potentially for a second. Well, some schools are really generous with need-based financial aid, okay? So, uh, you know, if we take... Um, I don't know, Middlebury is another one of these really expensive colleges, right? $95,000 thereabouts. That's bad news. That's scary. But if our student aid index is $30,000, that's what we pay to go to Middlebury. So probably less than our in-state uh, state school, right? Or a lot of our in-state state schools because they meet 100% of need. Now, that's in some ways an outlier. Not every college meets 100% in need in the way that Middlebury does or, or in Middlebury's of the like. So as we are building this list of schools, and obviously we're going to continue to talk about this, we need to know, number one, what's our student aid index? That's why make sure you set up your, your uh, MyCap account so you know that tonight. And how generous are not uh, are the colleges that you're targeting in terms of meeting need-based financial aid, again, if we are eligible for need-based financial aid. So a couple of things to talk about here and a, and a couple of, of coaching points uh, when it comes to your SAI, when it comes to your student aid index. And there's a few things here that I just wanna make sure that you just kind of clock these and take these with you um, because I think they're, th th this is on the financial side of the fence, maybe the more most important slide that I'm gonna uh, walk you through tonight. Number one, what's an asset? Well. The short answer to that is everything but your retirement accounts, okay? So they're going to ask you about everything under the sun, vehicles that you haven't even heard of before. But one of the biggest mistakes that families will make, and it's so easy to make this mistake, is that they include their retirement accounts on the FAFSA. Do not put any retirement accounts on the FAFSA, okay? That is uh, should not be included, but it is buried in the fine print, and in my opinion, almost a little bit deceiving in, in terms of how they ask that question about the net worth of your assets, but you're not going to put your retirement accounts on there. Okay. That's not really considered. So if we're a family that has consumer debt, credit card debt, personal loans, whatever it happens to be, colleges are, aren't even going to ask you about that. So you have to go out of your way to give them that information and make the direct ask that they consider that and look at your financial picture in a more holistic fashion 
than they actually do when they gather this information, right? That's an important part of the puzzle that, again, you have to be proactive with. Uh, with these individual colleges, because again, they're not going to go out of your way to ask for, nor are they going to consider uh, that information. Another important one here, parent assets versus student assets. The long and the short of this is that colleges are going to put a, 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 a much, they're going to put much more emphasis on any money in the student's name than they are in the parent's name. So <clears throat> let's just say we've got 10,000 bucks in the student savings account. It's not a gigantic number, right? But they've saved, they're industrious kids. They've saved money. They have some savings in there from their bar mitzvah, their first communion, whatever. Now, if that money's in a parent's name, it's not enough to move the needle in terms of need-based financial aid eligibility. If it's in the students, it is to the tune of, and again, this is a, a will vary from one college to the next, but to give you a, a, a ballpark estimate, that could impact your financial aid eligibility about $2,500 a year. So when we're talking about four years, that's a $10,000 swing in your aid eligibility. So what do you do? Easy solution there. I'm gonna add my name to that savings account as a parent and include that money as a, a again, a parent asset on the financial aid applications as opposed to a student asset. And again, that's gonna save me 10,000 bucks over the course of four years, right? Easy fix. and. If we, there's no silver bullets in this process, guys, right? There's no, hey, here's a quick fix to make college affordable. It's doing all of these little things right, getting these details right, it kind of all of these inflection points and decision points. And when we do that, then we make this uh, process as affordable uh, as it possibly can be. Another, just like retirement accounts, I would argue the second biggest mistake, as a matter of fact, this is data-driven, the second biggest mistake uh, that families make on financial aid applications is they assume their 529 savings should be in the student's name. And it makes a ton of sense. If I ask, most of you are probably listening to this going, well, yeah, our 529 isn't our kid's name because their name's on the account, their social number's on the account. I get the statement, it just says their name at the top of it. They don't own that account, guys. You as the parent or parents or grandparents own the 529. The student is just the beneficiary. So do not, you know, clock this one too. If you have a 529, that is your money, okay, which is better for financial aid. It is not the student. So, that, so that's a really, really important one. UGMAs and UTMAs, those are technically, those custodial accounts are technically owned by the um student, not the parent, but there are options to have those. And, and again, nobody do anything. You need, this is a longer conversation, but now there are options to have those converted uh, to 529s and included as, without liquidating them uh, and have them in, included as uh, parent assets as opposed to student assets, which again is making you eligible for a lot more in, in need-based financial aid eligibility. Those are some of the quick hitters here. The last one that I'll, I'll, I'll spend just a second on is real estate here. There's a whole bunch of colleges, more than we would like, that consider the value of your primary residence uh, minus the debt to be fair game. So if, if you're a homeowner and your home's worth 600 and you owe 200 on it, NYU is going to say that's a $400,000 checking account, okay, for, for all intents and purposes. That is, can be super impactful. So we want to know as we're building this list of colleges, well, who considers home equity? How much? Because some colleges don't consider that at all. Some colleges are the NYUs of the world and a whole bunch are somewhere in between. So number one, it matters, again, who we're targeting. And number two, there are strategies that we can implement to make sure that, 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 that the quote unquote damage that our real estate uh, causes, be it through our primary residence or other property, is minimized, right? We want to be smart about how we value that property, what we show in debt. And there's a whole bunch of gray area there that, again, we want to leverage to our advantage. But in the early stages of this process, the seed that we want to plant is that it matters. And again, in my experience, that's not necessarily um, common knowledge. From an income standpoint, we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this is one of these things where, by and large, it is what it is. Right. Uh, we can't do anything uh, outside of what our it says on our tax returns. Of course, we're trying to you know, work with good CPAs and drive down those those incomes as low as they can go, but it is what it is, right? My my 
point here, and again, what I'm uh, the seed I want to plant is that for you, class 2025 families, they're looking at your 2023 tax returns. So these tax returns you just finished or about to finish or filing an extension for, that is kind of the year in terms of establishing your eligibility for need-based financial aid. Now, you got to reapply every single year, but this is the base income year. This is the year that matters most in terms of setting that precedent. So it's important to be aware of that. And a lot of times we'll talk with 2026 families, right? From a financial standpoint, and they're like, oh, I'm way ahead of the game. It may feel that way, but you are already into Q2 of what's your base income year. So, uh, you know, it's important. And especially from the admissions standpoint, Brian's going to talk about the timeline um, is probably even further ahead of, of, of where you want to be than, than um, or the bigger priority maybe than, than the financial piece. Um, so let me just spend a couple of minutes. There's just going to be some of you just by the volume of folks that are on the call. There's no magic wand that we can wave or you can wave or anyone can wave that's going to make you eligible for need-based financial aid. The income is going to be too high plus the assets and, and you're not going to be entitled to need-based financial aid outside of the small amounts that you are entitled to, which we'll spend more time on in different presentations if you complete the process. Um, but that's but you don't want to pay $99,000 a year to go to NYU or anyone else, anywhere else. So what should you be doing? What can you be doing to get discounts elsewhere? Obviously, first and foremost, where's my going to kid get, where's my kid going to get a scholarship? I'm going to talk about that and show you how we do that in a second, right? And, and, and help you understand how you can do that. But colleges at, at NYU is a school I use as an example they won't consider you for merit-based scholarships unless you complete the FAFSA, unless you complete the CSS profile. You still have to go through the process. It's also important to note that not every school offers merit-based scholarship, okay? I, I mentioned Middlebury in passing uh, a, a little bit ago. There's not one kid that's there on a scholarship, right? Same with Tufts, same with Williams, same with every single Ivy League school. Scholarships do not exist there. If you're not paying full sticker price, it means you're getting some type of need-based discount. So as you're building this list, it's important to know, well, who fits into which bucket, right? And then lastly, a huge part of our, our um, recommendations, guidance, advice, et cetera, as this list of, of schools is being built, we have to apply to competing schools, right? Um, I had a conversation recently where a family was wanted to go to my alma mater, right? Stonehill College, a little private college just outside of Boston College here. They didn't like Providence College. I'm making them apply because I know we're going to use that offer and they're a direct competitor to go get more money out of Stonehill, right? That's a very, very important part of the process, especially if you are not eligible um, for need-based aid. And I, I know I'm not sharing my screen here, guys, because I want to just go over, uh, uh, give you some visuals to go over some of what I've been talking about um, quickly here right now. But like, as promised, we got we got a lot to cover. But for those of you that, and I just shared the link again in the chat, but most of you have already set up your account. So you know what your SAI is going to be. You know, you have confirmed, you haven't just listened to your neighbor or your friend or or whatever you're kind of here out there on the internet you know what your SAI is going to be. You know what your need-based financial aid eligibility is going to be. That's what we have staring you front and center, kind of in your face here. This is your, your home dashboard. And then you put some colleges in there. So you know, okay, am I going to pay full sticker price or close to full sticker price at these colleges uh, or not? Okay. And this is a great example because as you can see, you know, this is a Massachusetts resident, right? But some really, really expensive, really competitive schools, but we see that the $95,000 college is actually going to be more affordable than the in-state state school. This happens way more than common knowledge would or intuition would tell you, right? This happens all the time. This is not a really wacky case for a family. This family has average income, average assets, kind of the two bigger variables that are um, uh, really relevant in dictating the net cost projections here is that number one, it's a split household family. This is divorced parents. Okay. Number two, they have their homeowners that have a meaningful amount of equity. So that's why Boston College is is is, is going to be a lot more than Amherst. Okay. Um, you know, some private colleges look at both households and split family households, others do not, right? I'm telling you more than you need to know. Let the algorithm do the work for you, but these are all the things that you want to know 
ahead of time as you're building this list of schools. If you click into any school, it's going to tell you here's every scholarship they offer, the qualifications for each, and how much, if any, is my kid going to get. And then we have some context in terms of the why. Why is my kid going to get a discount at school A versus school B uh, if they are? Now, in terms of searching for scholarships, this is going to be, uh, I don't know of a better resource, but as you're building your list in kind of the early stages here, you can just go say, hey, go show me schools that are close to my home and I know my kid's going to want a smaller school and they're thinking about majoring in whatever it happens to be business, okay? And then I just want you to sort based on who's going to give them the most in scholarships, right? And this is just a really smart way to build your list. Again, especially if I'm using a family, it's not eligible for aid. So you can say, maybe Wheaton College wasn't on our list, but if they're going to give us 40 grand, regardless of my income, we'll go visit. We'll take a closer look, closer look, or maybe we'll just apply and use this as leverage for our top choice. If you are eligible for financial aid, you can sort just based on that, right? So, you know, here's some schools that are really good with you know, need-based financial aid and, you know, again, are kind of checking the boxes that are relevant for us on, on the uh, admission side. So anyways, those those are uh, some of the things that that we like to, uh, to do as we're helping families build uh, college lists with affordability in mind. But obviously, again, if you're one of those DIY families, those are things that you can be doing um, you know, right now and tools that you have at your disposal. So I've been talking for too long, too fast here. And I don't know, Brian, let's see, we can have a contest of who talks faster. I bet we're, uh, we got to be pretty close, but uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be tight. I'll do my best. Um, and so, um, you know, I left a few questions there for you, Matt, some that I figure you might uh, be, be best at kind of explaining on a longer, um, but um one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you today about is how uh, when I'm sitting down with a student kind of at the beginning of the process and we're starting to think, OK, how are we going to first build this college list? Whether that student is coming in with kind of a prescribed set of ideas of what they want or if I'm working with a student and this happens more than not and it's OK, they, they're like, I'm really excited to go to college. I'm really excited to start this journey, but I, I just have no idea what I want to do, Mr. Ford. And so um you know, first off, the average list nationally falls somewhere between 10 to 14 schools, but that is very much an average. That does not mean that that should be the size for everyone, because ultimately there are a lot of different factors that go into building a college list. The one thing I tell with all families that I'm working with private or the school, you know, at Boston College High School I work with, it's not my job to uh, tell you where to apply to and where not to apply to. It's my job to ensure that you have a well-balanced college list regarding all of the variables that come out through it. And so while there are a ton of those variables, they can make a list a little bit smaller or a little bit larger than kind of that average. Some of the bigger ones we're going to focus on today are obviously academics, the financial piece, which we've talked about a little bit already, um, you know, application deadlines and some of the regulations around individual schools. And then what I like to call kind of the grab bag. Um, and so if we want to go to the next slide, Matt. So the first is that academic. And this is, I think, kind of the first place that, oh, we jumped. <laughs> the first place that students um, that students kind of go to when they're thinking of, when I'm building a college list, this should I be looking at? So it's, you know, it's your SAT, ACT scores, it's your GPA, and, and kind of what does this all mean? Well, first of all, that's just two data points. And it's important to know that there is kind of a, a, a little bit of a battle waging war amongst schools and colleges in the United States and really throughout the world of what is the best way academically to view a student. A lot of that has to do with obviously standardized testing. Um, you know, very quick history lesson about standardized testing that we've talked about in previous webinars. But um, prior to the pandemic, there were some schools that were test optional and there's some schools that weren't. And it was kind of known which ones were and which ones weren't. Um, obviously in 2020, when everything shut down, that included SAT test centers. And so everyone was forced to become test optional because there was not a way for students to do standardized testing. Many of those schools gave commitments that they were going to stay test optional for a three or four year period. Well, that period has now ended. And so there are a number of schools that have looked um, through and have made the decision to go back to requiring test scores. Um, a few of the Ivy Leagues, such as Columbia, um, Yale, and Harvard have said, as well as Brown have said, we're going to require test scores again. But 
Cornell has come out and said, we're not going to require test scores. And in fact, we're going to continue to stay test optional. Um, schools such as, you know, um, UT Austin and U Florida have maintained that we're going to be test required. We're going to require SAT or ACT scores. But the University of California state system has gone so far to saying, I don't care if you have a perfect 1600, we're not even looking at it. That's what's known as test blind. Now, I say these things not to overwhelm you, but I, I start to want to show the nuance of what applying to one school can be so different to applying to other school. And that academic balance becomes so much more than just what is my GPA and what is my SAT score. So when I'm building a list for students, one of the things that I always look for is, you know, I want to see their full transcript. But I also, along with that transcript, I want to see what's the full class of offerings that they've been given as far as the curriculum in their current high school. Because another thing that schools are looking at, and they're looking at, you know, almost in a separate entity, is what's known as academic rigor. And this is essentially the level of difficulty of courses you have taken comparable to what has been offered at your high school. And so, for example, if you go to a high school that offers eight AP classes and you've taken four of them, that doesn't make your application weaker than a student who has maybe goes to a high school that offers 15 AP classes and they took nine of them. In essence, you can't be punished for what has or hasn't been offered to you at your high school. They will relate your rigor to kind of within the playing field so as that you've been put on. And so that GPA can mean a lot different things at, from different students, depending on what the academic rigor is too. So I always get that question like, you know, is a 3.7 here different than a 3.7 there? And the answer is yes, because it really depends on what classes you're taking. So when I'm building a list, I'm trying to find a healthy balance within the academics. So I go, I use the, the phrasing, you know, target safety reach. And what I look for, and this is kind of the first tip that I always tell families is when you go and you ask colleges about their academic information, do not ask them what their average GPA is. Because what they're going to tell you is one number amongst a number of applicants. Obviously, when I worked at BU, um, we got close to 90,000 applications in my final year there. So if I just tell you a mean number, that actually doesn't tell you a lot. You know, and to give you an idea, our mean number that year was around a 3.7 out of a 4.0 unweighted GPA. What you should be asking is, what is your middle 50% accepted average? So now I'm taking a much larger group of students that find it fits in the meaty center of their, their application pool. And to give you an idea, that year at BU, and again, this was a few years ago, so it's changed, but to give you an idea, for example, was more of like a 3.5 to a 3.9. It gives you a much better idea of who are the type of student that's being admitted to BU that year. And so if you fall kind of into that meaty center, I typically call it like a target school, keeping in mind all of the other things that we're about to talk to. If you fall above that, you know, you're, it's usually a safety school. If you fall below it, it's a reach school. Now, a perfect list would be kind of 50% target schools and then 25 safety, 25 reach. Does that always happen? No. And what I also tell students, again, it's not my job to tell you where, no, where not to apply and where to apply. I'm going to ensure you have that well-balanced college list. An example of that would be, you know, if you come in and your top school is the REACH school, then we're going to talk about some great safety options for you. Another example is like what Matt talked about earlier is from the financial component. And if you want to go to the next slide, Matt, is, you know, sure, if you're buying me, some... Um, it, it, just cut me off if you're going to uh, talk about this or if you did, yeah. Ryan. You can probably guess the question we get... Uh, a whole bunch uh, here or throughout really is like, should we send the test scores or should we not send the yeah. test scores? And <laughs> I answered it the best way I could, the way he coached me a few different ways. And then I said, you know, yeah, the best, I mean, the best answer. And I even mentioned it in, a, in one of the answers I put at the best counselors in the world will tell you their most popular answer will be. It depends. There should never be blanket counseling with within your college list. So when I work with individual students, I go down each individual college and we make the determination of using your standardized test scores if we feel like it accurately reflects who you are. And then also if we feel as that will be advantageous for you in that, you know, with that admissions process for that individual school. And this is where it's like real knowing kind of the insider information and knowing what schools are being honest, because there are also schools that are test optional in name but have been also been honest in saying things like, but if you have a good score, we would really rather see it. Great examples of that are Boston College here in Massachusetts and the University of Virginia, which is a, one of the most popular, but also one of the more competitive flagship universities in the country. 
I appreciate with how transparent they are is that every year they show their admit average, you know, how many percentage of the students they admitted and admit should gave scores and how many didn't. And so while they are test optional and some students do get in test optional, more students get in by sending test scores. And what you're also seeing is because schools have gone test optional, only the best scores are sending in their tests, which has essentially inflated all the averages that schools report. And so even for some students who fall below those reported averages, I still encourage them to send their test scores. This is the type of unique counseling that can really change the narrative of your college application success by going school by school and not just saying, all right, well, I got a 1230. I'm not going to send my scores to anywhere because there are some schools that very much can, can benefit by getting those test scores. And it's using the relationships that we have with all those college reps and all of those colleges to really benefit our families. So I'll, I won't go too quickly into financial because we talked about it a lot, but at the same time, one of the things that's really crucial is, is uh, an example that Matt came, you know, if, if, and I'll, I'll use my own alma mater. I went to Bryant university, small competitive business school in Rhode Island. If I have students who are interested in Bryant, you better believe I'm going to tell them to apply to Bentley and Babson as well, too, because the three B's are very competitive for small school minded business students here in the New England area. And so even if you're not interested in those schools, if you're later appealing an award, it has to be kind of popular in that sense. Same, you know, in the D.C. area, if I have a student who's interested in George Washington, I'm going to have them apply to American. I'm going to have them apply to James Madison or U Maryland College Park. Schools that those, you know, are naturally competing with each other for applicants. Uh, you know, sometimes it even come down to athletic conferences. Schools in the Big East, like Villanova, comparable to UConn or Marquette, those type of schools are constantly competing for applications. And so we'll, we'll work with you in that. Now, we're not going to have you apply to this whole list of schools that you hate, but there might be one or two that we're going to say, hey, there's a real value to having this school on the list. If you get in and you get some money from them, it could be beneficial for an appeal later on. Now, the other big piece of building a list, and this comes further down the road, is making the decision of what is the best time to apply to certain schools. And this can really vary from school to school. A lot of people will say, well, I'm either going to apply early or regular, but that doesn't really narrow it down anymore. Now there's early decision or when you're binded or there's restrictive early action where you're not binded, but you can't apply early to any other schools. Oh, but wait, if you're applying restrictive early action to say Stanford, they do allow you to apply early to other schools as long as it's an in-state scholarship that you otherwise wouldn't qualify for. You see where it's already getting kind of confusing? Or you could just apply early action and you could apply early action to Northeastern and their admit rate is 18%. Or you can apply regular decision to Northeastern and their admit rate was 2% this year. So it gives you a total idea of the difference of looking at these deadlines and what is most appropriate for you. And again, this is where good counselors will say it depends. It depends on the student. It depends on the college. And it just depends on the situation. Sometimes it even depends to the academic major that you're applying to or a particular scholarship or a particular honors college program within that college. And so just saying, hey, I'm going to apply to all my schools early isn't necessarily the best strategy. Or, you know what, I don't want to give myself the stress. I'm just going to apply to all my schools on the February deadlines. Also necessarily not the best strategy. And we use the relationships that we have on hand to be able to understand the nuance of what's happened in past years and how we can help. You know, and now ED2 has become more and more popular. So I didn't get in to say Brown ED1. So now I'm going to use my ED2 to apply to Columbia or NYU or BC. And that's a whole game. And how does that work? And so there's a lot of more nuance that I think people realize, even when coming and deciding what deadline should I be applying to certain schools for? Yeah. I, and again, as we always do, tons of questions around this one. And let me put it in my more <clears throat> layman's terms. And, and we, we, we're pretty, I, I would say, uh, aligned on this as a company. Everybody has a, has their own, I, I guess, different uh, specifics within this. But I'd say we're all on the same page. But uh, for those of you that are hearing some of this, these terms for the first time, early decision is, is is the one that we have to be really, I guess, calculated with because we're signing an agreement. Multiple people are signing agreement that tells that college if we get accepted, we're going there. Okay, so it's a contract essentially, right? Um, 
And so that's an, a really important decision, really big decision. And how I answer it, and again, I think we all say it in, in some variation of this, is that you got to be able to check two boxes with a lot of confidence if you're applying your early decision to a school. Number one, your kid just happened to be one of those kids that had this aha epiphany moment. I have to go to this college. I am in love with this college, right? You just are one of, the, which I would say is kind of the minority, right? Most kids, they, they don't really know, but some do, right? So they have to just know this is where I want to go. Okay, that's number one. Number two, you have to know about how much this college is going to cost before you get the offer, right? You have to know about how much, uh, uh, about where it fits within your affordability profile. And you have to be comfortable with that as a family. You have to be able to stare at that number and say, we can do that for four years, taking into account inflation, other siblings, et cetera, et cetera. If you can check both of those boxes with a lot of confidence, you have our blessing, not that you need it, of course, but you have our blessing to go early decision. If you're hesitating with either one of those, it's probably not early decision might not be the best decision. So, uh, you know, Brian, I know you have kind of your own talk track around. Yeah, that. I know. I mean, I think you did a really good job in summarizing it. And the one thing that I'll add is one, obviously, that because you're making that binding agreement, there is usually a higher admit rate to schools in early decision. Schools are looking at you and kind of saying, like, can you fit here? Um, and so we like to make sure that that can happen. The one thing I'll also say is, as a school counselor, I'm one of those people that has to sign that document. And so I'm not only putting my own reputation with the school on, not on the line per se, but kind of in saying, you know, with my, my with my colleagues from the other side of the aisle uh, of saying, like, hey, I, I vouch for this student. They're they're going to honor this agreement. But in many ways, when I sign that, I always consider like I'm representing my institution as well, too. And I, I tell students it's not to scare them from applying early decision, but it's to say, like, if you for some reason try to renege on this deal, it's not just you that it's affecting. It could be future students as well, too, from this school, um, because then that college may think, hey, a couple of years ago, we had a couple of kids back out of ED from this school. Do we really want to admit the same amount kind of thing? Um, and so know that that kind of plays a role in that early decision process. Now, the last thing is I kind of call the grab bag. And this is where we really get into the nuance of college admissions, because 15 to 20 years ago, it would have been, all right, I picked my eight to nine schools. Maybe I'll apply to two early. I'll apply six regular. I write my one personal essay and I move forward. I send my SAT scores. Well, now there are these things called supplemental essays. And I'll go through this list kind of quick so that we have time for questions. But supplemental essays were around before this year, but they certainly ballooned more this year when the affirmative action ruling by the Supreme Court in August of 2023 came down. And essentially right before the admission years was a start, they said that race, race, ethnicity, and that form of background could no longer be considered within college admissions. So schools wanted to find a way legally to allow students to talk about their identity, their background, who they were. And so I don't say this in a negative way, but what they did was they added more supplemental essays. Now, what supplemental essays are in, the, in their root form is they are essays specific to an individual school or college. It's an additional essay you have to write on top of your personal essay, which would go to all the schools and colleges you're applying to, that is asking something more specific about that school. So some can be very straightforward. Why do you want to attend Boston University? Why do you want to attend Georgetown? Others can be a little more specific. The example I always love to give is from the University of Vermont. Two of their more famous alumni are Ben and Jerry. We all know them when we have our ice cream on Saturday nights while I'm watching Bravo with my wife. What I need to do, what, what they ask is, what type of ice cream flavor would you be and why? So you may ask that question and then move on to, say, Georgetown supplemental essay question, which lists their mission statement and ask a 17 and 18 year old to define what are the exact ways that you can live by my mission statement moving forward. Now that's not delineating or diminishing UVM's essay and saying it's less serious, but it talk, it gives you a good idea of just the vast difference types of questions that students are gonna be required to answer. University of Southern California takes it even a step further. They have 10 questions that are 50 words and sometimes 50 characters minimum maximum. And so the whole idea is they're trying to re-represent what like a tweet would be like. And so you have these instances where you're asking, what's my favorite movie of all time? What's my best place to be? What are three words that define me? 
all very kind of unique questions that can really stress a student out. But because of the addition of so many essays, what many students find for an even semi-competitive list, you can have anywhere from 15 to 25 or even to the 30s of additional essays that you are going to have to write. And in many cases, have to write those before the November 1st deadlines, which is now really the most popular deadline for most schools for any type of early deadline, whether it be early decision or early action. So it brings I'm, on. What, what yeah. was the Chicago question? And again, I don't want to get too spend too much time on these things. Is it, am I thinking of the right school with how wacky that one? Crazy There's a few. Thing. The other really wacky one to me is Wake Forest, where they literally just say, make a top 10 list and they give you no other guidelines. And so you are forced to not only then think of a topic that you think is most important or most interesting, but then actually list out 10. <laughs> and so it just gives you kind of an idea of what these schools are asking from students. Demonstrated interest is another thing. What this means is exactly what it sounds. It's getting out into those schools and making yourself known. At nauseum, I tell my students, the more you make yourself a person and less of a piece of a paper in this process, the better chance you're going to have. For school, even for schools, whether they track demonstrated interest, which means they track how many times you visit campus, how many times you talk to college reps, things like that, or schools that don't, there is value. This is a human process. And I always give the example that I talk about is that when I was working at BU, I would read somewhere between 80 to 100 applications a day. And so I was waking up and all day I would read applications. And you don't know if you're going to be application number three of the day or application number 84 of the day. And you can imagine that by 84, it's gonna be a little lot better if I know that I've met that student and I have an idea of who they are. And when I dive into their essay, I remember them when I met them at that college fair. And so I grill my students to make sure that they are following up with thank you notes and they are taking the time to go to those college visits when our reps come to our school, go to our college fairs, go to area tours or receptions that schools are putting on. So that even if it's a school that doesn't track demonstrated interest, they still, when they sit down and say, you know what, Matt Carpenter, I remember this guy. He came to my visit when I came to the high school in the fall. He came to the reception that I hosted in the Boston area when I came and I wanted to meet with a bunch of students. This is someone that, you know, I have a face to the name when I'm reading, and this is a human process. And as much as admissions counselors at times are painted like denial robots, we're not. We're reading to admit even at the most competitive schools. And the more you get to know that person, the better it is. Um, honors program is another thing, usually means more essays, usually means more interviews, and it's unique to every individual school. There's no set standard for what it means to have honors programs, and they mean so many different, different schools. We've gone into test optional a little bit, but that's gonna be something that's nuanced for every school. What about interviews? Some schools require interviews. Some schools encourage them. Some schools don't do them at all. And so how does that play in? And is it an informative interview or is it an evaluative interview? That's a big difference. Is it something that's going to go right on your application and you'll essentially be part, partly judged for it in terms of if you're going to be admitted or not, or it's just an informative one where you just get to tell them a little bit more about yourself. We talked about the college rep correspondence anymore, but I, you know, I mentioned, I saw a question that was like, how do I find out my middle 50% averages? You can search any school, type in, you know, Georgetown or U Maryland college admission staff. And what will happen is it will bring up that website that will be college reps. And you can look up who is the college rep that is assigned for your area. Usually it's done by state. If it's an in-state school, maybe by certain groups of high schools or counties. For example, when I worked at BU, my territory was Texas and Oklahoma. I was traveling there consistently, meeting with students. Anytime an application came from those two states, I was the first eyes looking at it. Um, Taking advantage of your local area. Here in Boston, we love to say we're the higher education capital of the world. There's more schools in Boston per square mile than anyone else in the world. So what I always tell the students that I'm working with locally, but no, no matter where you are in the country, you can do that. Even if you don't wanna to go to school in Boston, I can give you some schools to look at that maybe have similar characteristics to the type of schools that you are looking at. So maybe you don't wanna to go to New England, but you really wanna to go to a larger research urban university. Well, then I want you to go look at Northeastern University and take what that looks like and get that feel. And then we can talk about what area of the country there might be similar examples of. Maybe you want to go to a, a smaller kind of liberal arts university. Well, then like a Brandeis would be a very great opportunity to go take a look at or a Williams or an Amherst or a Clark in Worcester, schools like that. 
And then we won't even go down this road, but this is something that obviously comes in. What if you're a recruited student athlete? What if you're looking to do an arts program? What if you're looking to do, say, an accelerated medical program? One, I feel, you know, I, I've worked with all of these types of students. I myself have been both a high school and collegiate coach during my career. And then I was also a college athlete. And so we've been able to work with these students, even through College A Pro, of helping them navigate this in a little bit and, and what that means and how that process changed and how it can be different from the Division three level to the Division one level, or what I would say is kind of Division one A when you're talking, you know, big SEC, ACC type schools, or maybe the smaller Division one schools like the Ivies or like some smaller liberal arts schools, things like that. Even those processes are nuanced. So this is all to say and to not to get you overwhelmed, but what it is to say it is is no longer just... I'm going to take the six schools around my local area, apply to those, and see how it works out. There is a lot of nuance to this process, and we want to be able to help you through that. There it is, yeah. Grab bag indeed. So lastly, and I'll go through this super quick. These are kind of front-of-the-brain characteristics of a school that we look at, um, and, and they're the kind of obvious ones. Location, size, campus type. You know, what type of school is it? What are the academic interests? What I really encourage students to look at is the next slide. And these are the type of questions I'm asking students when I'm helping them build, build a list. How big do you want your class sizes to be? How accessible do you want your faculty to be to you? What, a, what does an advisor mean to you? You know, Do you utilize your counselor in a big thing? Um, is this kind of a, a do you want a full-time remote or adjunct faculty? What is their access to office hours? What is the external location like? Do you want a big city around you or do you want to be in the middle of nowhere? You know, when I always tell kids to, when they're visiting campuses, you should do the five to 10 minute kind of circle around as well, too. And, and, and look around that local area. Where are you going to be going grocery shopping? Where can you possibly get a job? What are the type of restaurants that you can go to? Are there parks that you can hang out? Things like this. Campus layout. You know, Matt and I both went to smaller schools in New England. And I always like to say I loved that I could wake up at 756 a.m. and make my 8 a.m. class. But that's not for everyone. Some people want that big sprawling campus, like a Notre Dame or something like that, where you walk through the archways every morning. And then even that academic approach. Are you students who love working in group projects? Well, there are certain schools that do that a lot. Or are you more of an individual type student? Are you a student who wants to be at a small table or a big table? These are the type of things. And then we just went through it, but obviously the admissions requirements as well too. And then these are just some of the even more specific list building, but I've talked about it when we think of really competitive fields. And these are the, some of the things we work with students on, whether it be community service involvement, um, additional letters of recommendation or who you should be asking for, or your teachers, application fees, specific research opportunities, summer program involvement, all stuff that we have to kind of work through with students when they're applying to some of those more competitive schools in the country. All right, so give me a second here. Okay, so th th this we kind of, we teased, right? I think Brian and I both teased it. And, and the takeaway from this slide specifically is that, and again, this is another seed we're planting for most of you underclassmen uh, a year or two years out. The takeaway is that when you're given a financial offer from these colleges, it's like any other major investment in your life. You're not going to accept the first answer, right? Or the first offer, rather. We always want to go back and negotiate. We're negotiating, always. We are always, and that is what we are incredibly busy with this time of year with the class 2024 families, especially with this FAFSA mess. However, we cannot use the word negotiate. The word that we have to use in this little ecosystem of ours uh, that is pretty particular is appeal. But again, at this very early kind of infant stages of the process for, for you and your family, we want to plant the seed and we're going to reiterate this, that you can and you should uh, get more money than that initial offer, whether it's scholarships, whether it's need-based financial aid, uh, whether it is both. Um, but I want to do here and give me a second so I can... Uh, share the right screen wherever I am. Um, but I want to talk about kind of next steps. I mean, we always uh, are very intentional about for any presentation we give, we want to make sure that you have action items for the next step. So what should you be doing now? And no matter what, you should be doing something. Okay, everybody uh, should be doing something. Um, 
even at a, at a minimum, just continue to follow along with us. I was just answering a question. I said, on average, we do four to eight presentations every single week to different classes on different subject matter, but just pay attention. I mean, we consider ourselves to be the just kind of shepherds uh, through this process. And, uh, you know, there's so much noise out there. Um, we like to consider ourselves the source of truth, right? So if you have a question, uh, it doesn't matter what it is in this space, we want you to come to us first, um, or at least be one of your stops as you're doing different research and checking different things and back checking and, and all of that. But what I want to talk about is specifically because Brian, our buddy Brian here, if you're impressed with him, his Roster for the class 2025 and 26 is almost full. Uh, so I will tell you uh, what it looks like, kind of how we support you specifically. Just stay on with us so I can kind of walk you through that process. And then you can decide um, if it's something you want to do in any capacity, obviously. I mean, I kind of like this nice, um, I don't know, it's a nice arena to kind of talk about how, how we work because you can decide if it's something you want to do with obviously no no pressure one way or the other, but I put this link in the chat so everybody has access to it, but it, it does, I think, a decent job of walking through um, most of our value props or, or the bigger ones. Now, these are our more comprehensive services, but I'm also going to talk about our just kind of, if you just want to dip your toe in the water, I'm going to talk about that as well. So just uh, bear with me for a couple minutes, but these are our, what we call wake me up when it's over packages, which basically means if you want us to take the wheel for you, um, that's what I'm going to walk through now uh, versus if you're a DIYer, if you're someone that like is like, hey, we're all over this, but we just want a little extra help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, do a minute on that as well. And there's two broad types of our services, right? The financial focused, the admissions focused, and then obviously we have some folks that are like, I need help with both of those things. Now, from a financial standpoint, and let me, uh, again, you guys are each have access to this link but these are some this is some real data that i think is is very relevant and if i'm in your shoes i would be assessing these types of numbers what's our average roi right folks that that engage in our services what do they generally see on the back end of that once the dust is has settled um and here's uh, some of these stats right in terms of dollar amount saved over the course of four years of college hours saved during the application process between admissions and financial aid. This is a combination uh, of the two of those. And then this is just for our admissions package. Again, on average, three times more likely to get accepted into your student's top college. Now, does that mean you're going to get in? Of course not. You, we know what these acceptance rates are, but we know the averages in terms of folks that engage with our admission services and those that that uh, navigate it on their own. Now, from a just a financial standpoint, folks that hire us just for this part of our service, again, we we make sure that you're applying to competing schools. We make sure that you're applying to schools that are within your affordability profile, and we proactively recommend those. We do all financial aid applications for you, FAFSA, CSS profile, institutional applications. We do the negotiating slash appeal part of the process on your behalf. We're the ones that show you, okay, how am I going to pay for all four years of college for all four kids uh, down to a dollar, right? If I don't have it all in a 529 and I need to borrow, what loan should I take? Should I use my 529 up front over the course of four years? That's that service. And I describe our financial service as kind of like we're grabbing the wheel for parent or parents. We're kind of taking over there versus our admission services that are 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 really we're taking over and Brian specifically uh, for the student right and there's two types of admission services that we offer. The first one is is basically Brian gets involved now and the first thing that he's going to do is he's going to stare at, at the he's going to stare at the uh, the current um, transcript right of of your student right are they on track in terms of their current course selection to where they want to go in the classroom extracurriculars etc. When it comes time to game time, making sure that we're nailing the essay. He's read 60,000 of these essays, right? What is going to make a difference? Same thing on the admissions front, the applications, the supplemental application. So we have one package that's uh, um, $4,000. Now, obviously, we're running a promotion uh, tonight, right? And I'll, I'll talk about the details in a second here. That's why you see the the lower the crossed out amounts here um but this includes up to 20 hours of brian's guidance through the admissions process 
right? And then we have a more uh, uh, comprehensive admissions package that doesn't have a limit to the hours, right? It's unlimited hours. It's up to 10 colleges, okay? So that's, uh, again, just a more comprehensive package where your student, and obviously you as a family are working with Brian one-on-one from now until your, your student's actually moving into the dorm. And then we have, as I referenced, some of these, what we call our combo packages, right? These families that say, hey, look, we need both of those things. We we want our student to have guidance on the admission side, and we don't want to be the one that are that are driving this to say, hey, have you are you on track with your essay? Do you know everybody that has a supplement? Do you know the deadlines, right? Uh, you know, you want somebody else to kind of be that third party, which there's legitimate value in. Um, but you also want financial aid guidance, right? And make sure that you're threading the needle here, right? So we're grabbing the wheel for kind of both, both of those. Um, so in, again, within this link, if this is something that you know you want to do, okay, any of these, sign up tonight, right? And, and use the coupon code. Let me put it in here. I got to make sure, Ryan, remind me what the coupon code is for uh, the 600 bucks off. I want to say it was- it Is 425. 425. So now- even if you're not a class of 2025 family, if you're 26 or 27, that will still work. But for any of these packages, if you if you sign up tonight, you'll get the uh, 600 bucks off when you go to click on this link or or scan it through that coupon code. But I think, or maybe obviously the discount is significant, but it also guarantees you that you'll be working with Brian because he'll be done this month, uh, certainly in terms of admissions folks. Uh, we'll have more room on the financial aid side, but we, uh, but but again, Brian's roster is uh, just about full for for this year, so that's why there is some urgency on that front. Let me just kind of add, I think, an important layer there. This is obviously a huge commitment from a dollar amount tonight, and some of you are are seeing us for the first time, so you might be like, "This is amazing," but this is just uh, too big of an investment to make. Um, Sign up tonight to lock in your coupon code, lock in Brian. You can talk to either of us at any point this week after the fact. You just write into support at collegeaidpro.com and say, hey, I just signed up for um, the combo package or just the admissions package, whatever you sign up for, just the financial package. But I just want to talk, I want to talk to Brian or Matt before I just kind of follow through with this. Do that. We'll meet with you this week, early next week, whatever. And if you decide to you know it, it's actually not the right fit for us. Or I didn't get to talk to my spouse or my ex or whatever, um, or my kid, right? And uh, we want our money back, full refund, no questions asked, whatever. So just to lock in your, your discount and to lock in Brian, do that tonight. Now, if you're a family that says, hey, I'm a either a DIY family, or I just, I don't care about getting Brian or I don't care about the discount. I'm not making that commitment tonight. Here's what you need to do tonight. And don't overthink this one, guys. At least book an hour with Brian. Book an hour with Brian, okay? See what, what value he provides in that hour and see if that's enough for you guys to kind of manage the process uh, from, from here on out on your own or just kind of see if he's up the snuff and and or or if you just want him to take over from there. The best way to do that, so within your MyCap account, if you're on the free version of the account, this is going to say upgrade as opposed to talk to an expert. You're going to click on this button. Now, I'm already on the premium version. So all I do, um, it, what this screen will show when you say upgrade is it'll say show three versions. You're going to select software plus expert, okay? And then you're going to go uh, after you pay, it's going to say, who would you like to meet? And you can select Brian from our drop down. Okay. And that'll make sure that you can meet with Brian, book an hour with him, use that coupon code. Okay. Use that coupon code. Um, what is it? 425. They're asking for it again. Okay. 425. Yeah. 425. And what you do is you get 20% um, off of, of, of that. And what it comes with is a one-on-one -on -one hour with Brian plus a, a full access to our platform for the year. Okay, so you get, w w I showed you that, because there you guys are on the free version, most of you. You can only put three schools in there. You don't get that advanced search that I showed you. But if you upgrade to the software plus expert, you uh, use that 425 coupon code, gets you 85 bucks off. So I think it comes out to whatever that is, like 270 or something like that. 
You get full access to the platform for the year, an hour with Brian. You can use that at any time. If you want to uh, wor work with us in a, in a more comprehensive capacity after that, you can credit that hour towards it. So again, at a minimum, do that. Um, that expires. I, I should have said this at the beginning. Those of you that follow along with us know this. Anytime we do a live event, we always give a, a coupon code that it's just for our live audiences because we value our live audiences because the questions and the, the back and forth just make it for a, a more compelling event. And I think uh, hopefully a better event for you all. So here's the thing. Here's the takeaways. At a minimum, continue to follow along with us. Right. We were, are going to continue to provide education. Um, if you know you want comprehensive help. Lock in your discount tonight. Lock in Brian tonight. So make sure that you go to um, this link here and sign up for whatever service that you want. Use that that uh, Ford uh, 25 coupon code. If that's just, uh, and again, you'll have the opportunity to kind of gut check that with either of us um, over the next couple of days. And if you decide it's not the right fit or your spouse or ex-spouse is not on board, no problem, uh, full refund. But I think, again, the, the one to not overthink here is at least upgrade, do the software plus an expert, book an hour with Brian, and you know, you're know you going to get a ton out of that. You're going to have access to the premium version of software for a year. And if you want to do anything beyond it, uh, certainly you'll have the opportunity. Um, but yeah, Brian, I know, I know we went over here. I appreciate you staying on. Anything that I missed? Anything you want to add? No, no. I mean, like I said, uh, the goal tonight is to kind of you know, it's not to cause panic and it's not to cause anxiety. It's just to, it's to work really hard to inform you all of just the nuance of the process. And, and, you know, there were so many challenges this year. And so we can only expect what it's going to be like next year. And so we hope, you know, and I personally hope that I have the opportunity to work with all of you. I love working with students, you know, all over the country. It's great for me. It's, it's great for you. Um, I, I joke with families, like for some reason I decided to make the most stressful part of kids lives you know an every year thing for myself um, but uh for for me i really enjoy working through this process and so um, i hope that i have the opportunity to work with some of you 100 percent. and somebody's asking where can we find bios if you if you go on calljpro.com and 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 see uh our one of the options is i'll just show you quickly here give me a second yeah, so for anybody that you're, um, if you want to see bios, if you go to, um, or is it consult with an expert, you can kind of go down uh, the list here. And there's, so for example, if you want to see Brian, you can, uh, you know, see his kind of credentials and schedule a meeting either right through there again or through your uh, College A Pro account. But that's that's where you can find bios. Um, all right, Brian. Appreciate you, dude. Thanks as always. And uh, have a good night, everyone. See you soon enough. Good night, everybody.